Welcome to Stunt Stories. I'm Corey Eubanks. There was this one episode on the Dukes of Hazard that I will never forget. It was um, an episode where the General Lee was being remote control driven by these bad guys. And back then in 83, 84, I believe it was somewhere, one of those two seasons that we did, um, that we didn't have that kind of technology. They didn't have like they do today where you can remote control drive these vehicles down windy dirt roads and do mini ramp jumps and slide corners. So they thought, well, how are we going to accomplish this and and convince the audience that this generally is actually being remote control driven. There's nobody inside. So the concept was, let's shove Corey <laughs> down onto the floorboard and cover him with some dubatine. That's some black cloth. And we'll give him a, a walkie talkie and we'll tape it to the floorboard so he can hear. And Jerry Summers who would act as the stunt coordinator sometimes on second unit, he will watch me drive and give me verbal direction to your left, to your right, slow down, speed up. That was the game plan. That's what we did. And I had to drive the General Lee from down on the floor, down in front of the seat, cramped up in like a little fetus position. And, you know, like you're curled up in a ball with the emergency brake gouging me in my back. And I would, with my left hand, I would reach up and they gave me just a little piece of the steering wheel down at the bottom that I could grab onto to steer because the interior camera that was in the back seat on some some sticks in the back seat just barely framed that out. It could see out the front windshield and the whole front of the cab of the vehicle except that one little piece down at the bottom of the steering wheel where I would pitch the wheel. I would have to throw the wheel and stop it and throw the wheel back the other way and stop it and not let my hand move too far up the steering wheel because it would actually pop up in the frame. Then with my right hand, I would push down on the accelerator and or the brake to slow the vehicle down. We did this driving down dirt roads at 25, 35, maybe 40 miles per hour because it sounded like we were really hauling ass a couple of times. You know, the sound of the gravel, you know, you're right there on the floor. You can hear the gravel beneath the wheels uh, real, real clear <laughs> and kind of get a sense of how fast you were going. So we would do this, um, as I said, going around turns and and uphills and downhills. There was even one shot we did that I had to go off a mini ramp jump on the floorboard of the General Lee, being guided by Jerry Summers as I'm approaching the mini ramp. And I would hear directions like, to your left, to your left, speed up, speed up, speed up, to your right, to your right, to your right, straighten it out, the, to your left, the other, the, that's good, hold it there. And those are my directions. Very nerve wracking. Um, I don't recommend you going out and trying to do a mini ramp jump um, on the floor of a, of a vehicle, it's not comfortable at all. When I say a mini ramp jump, our r- mini ramp jumps were about 18 inches high. And we would sometimes go as far as, you know, 50, 60 feet. Um, I wasn't going that far when I was driving from the floorboard. I was just doing maybe a 20, 20 to 30 foot jump, but still quite the impact. When, the vehicle would would hit the ground. You you knew that you had just you had just landed. There was there was no question about it. Kind of like the the little ball inside the policeman's whistle. That's how you kind of felt like you were just being rattled all all around. Because I had no seatbelt on. There was there was no seatbelt on the floor of the General Lee. So this episode was extremely uh, challenging and <laughs> um, nerve wracking for me. And I had been driving that General Lee on the floor all week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Now it's like the last shot of Friday. And I am told by our second unit director, Gary Baxley, that all it is is me going down the road, 
just driving down the road, heading back towards base camp. Oh, Corey, we got one more shot. We got to go right away. Let's just grab this real quick. That's all the direction I got was that I was going to be driving down this road, you know, and I was going to go whatever speed Jerry Summers had me set to go. You know, he would tell me, slow down, slow down, speed up, speed up. So I drove down to the number one starting position and I would do that while, you know, sitting straight up in the seat, get to my number one. And now I had it down to a routine. I knew I'd put the car in park. I'd climb down onto the floor. I'd pull the black dubatine over the top of me, uh, check my radio volume on my walkie talkie, um, reach up, put the car in drive, push on the brake. And I'd say, okay, I'm at number one, standing by, ready to go. I'd say that over the walkie talkie. And I said, oh, I hear, okay, we're rolling cameras, action, Corey, come ahead. So I start driving, start pushing on the accelerator, going down the road. And I'm hearing the gravel under the, under the car. And I'm like, no, this is a comfortable speed. We're probably going 25, maybe. And I hear Jerry Summers, okay, a little bit to your left, a little, little bit to your right. Okay, a little bit back to your left. Okay, hold it there. And then that was it. And I'm, I'm kind of going, wait a minute, usually... He continues to give me direction. And for some reason now, he's like stalling. This is like the, one of the, the longest gaps in between Jerry Summers communicating to me over the walkie-talkie. This is like, you know, odd. And I remember kind of reaching down just to make sure my volume was up all the way. And I was even thinking maybe my walkie-talkie has gone, the battery's gone dead. Because normally he would be coaching me all the way through the shot. And all of a sudden, I crash head on into something. Just, I mean, just like a solid brick wall or a steel wall, just. <clears throat> and the emergency brake gouges into my back. The steering wheel bends down and it, it starts to pinch my neck and this radiator fluid is coming in through the floorboard and spitting all over the, the hot engine block. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I must have just driven head on into a tree. I mean, I hit something that did not budge. And I was in excruciating pain and couldn't even get the door open to get out because it buckled, it buckled the General Lee, the body of it, and, and it was it was jammed shut. And I could hear voices, everyone running into me. And are you okay? Are you guys okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, you guys, it's just me in here. And they pull open the door. They force the door open and they, they kind of lift up the steering wheel column so I could get, I slide out and I, I go to, and I, I lay down onto the ground. And I remember looking underneath the General Lee and I saw Clifford Happy flop to the ground. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I crashed into a, into a tree and maybe Clifford was behind the tree and somehow he got hurt. And then I go to roll over to stand up and I see that there's the Daisy Jeep is crushed into the grill of the General Lee. What I had hit head on was the Daisy Jeep, Daisy Duke Jeep head on. Clifford Happy was driving. Russell Solberg was still in the passenger seat, moaning and groaning because he had a lap belt on, and and not, excuse me, not a lap belt. He had a seat belt on, and it was like it had almost, you know, cut him in half. I mean, he had it really hurt his 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 stomach and his and he was in extreme extreme pain, and. So they started saying, okay, let's, you know, let's get these guys to the hospital. Let's get these guys to the hospital. And I'm thinking, oh my God, Gary Baxley did not tell me that what we were actually doing was a head-on near miss and that there was also a camera uh, on, the, on the side of the, of the Daisy Jeep. And on the approach, I guess the direction he gave Clifford was to go camera right. And I think Clifford got a little confused between was Gary talking about his camera right or my camera right, because I also had a camera inside my car. And at the last second, decided, whoop, I got to go the other way, crank the wheel. And those those vehicles on that type of surface, it's like driving on ball bearings. It's a very hard, compacted dirt road with gravel over the top. So even though you're going forward, 
with inertia, with speed, you know, your momentum going forward. You can't just turn the wheel and expect it to, to respond like you are on asphalt. It just doesn't work that way. You, you plow and the front end pushes a long ways before it starts to maneuver the vehicle, the direction that you're asking it to go. And when Clifford had made that last second decision to veer, um, the Jeep just plowed and we hit head on and uh, we're not expecting it, especially me. I had no idea that they were even in the, in the same shot as I. So we peel ourselves up off the ground and climb into this van and off to the hospital we go. And when we got to the hospital, um, Clifford was making some <laughs> some uh, uh, loud moaning and groaning, and he was also in a lot of pain, and, and so was Russell. And uh, so, you know, Clifford kind of sounded like a a cat that had its paw stuck in the car door. So they 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 took him first and rushed him down into the this one room, the emergency room. Um, and then they, then Russell, um, you know, he was holding his stomach and bent over and in a lot of extreme pain. And so they, they, they took him and they put him on a gurney and hauled him off to another, uh, a room down the hallway. And I was then asked by one of the nurses, what, what's wrong with you? Or what happened to you? And I go, well, I was driving the car on the floor and the emergency brake kind of, you know, stuck me in my my back right here. And, and she goes, okay, well, I, I think you're going to be okay. Let's just lay you down on this gurney right here. So I lay on this gurney in the hallway of the hospital and they, they all rush off to go help Clifford and, 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 and Russell. And I'm laying there and I wasn't really in tremendous pain. It, it, it hurt, you know, it felt like someone took a sledgehammer and hit me in my, my spine, but I was, I, I didn't feel like I had any internal bleeding or anything that was really very serious, but it did hurt. But I was anyway, toughing it out, just laying there on this gurney and about 15 minutes go by. And all of a sudden I hear a, a, another gurney approaching. It had squeaky wheels, kind of just squeaky wheel you can imagine you know this this thing approaching down the, you know the the hallway and and the nurse says okay i'm just going to leave you right here for a few minutes and she parks this other gurney right alongside me with this gentleman laying there moaning and groaning and just oh god mm, oh and i'm like oh my god this guy's in a lot of pain and I, I kind of look at him and I could tell by the look on his face, he was in a lot of pain and, and I felt so bad for this man. And I said, what happened? Were you in a car accident? He goes, no, man, I was, I'm a stunt man. And I was doing a thing called an air ram on this TV show called Airwolf. And I overshot the, the fall pads and landed on a, a big boulder and, and I broke my hip. I said, so you're a stunt man. He goes, yeah, Hollywood stuntman. I go, what's your name? He goes, Tommy Huff. I said, Tommy Huff. Now, I've heard of Tommy Huff. He's a, he was a living legend. And unfortunately, Tommy is no longer with us. But Tommy Huff, double tough, Tommy Huff was a living legend in the stunt industry. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get to meet Tommy Huff. And I'm like, Tommy, my name's Corey Eubanks. I, I also am a stuntman. And we had a head-on collision on Dukes of Hazard. And he looks at me with this, I'll never forget the look on his face. Like, are you kidding me? And he starts to chuckle. He goes, what do you know? Couple stuntmen meeting in the hallway of a hospital. Hey, I guess we're not very good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and he extends his hand and I shook his hand. I said, it's really a, an honor to meet you, Tommy. I, so, I mean, what are the chances of two stunt guys meeting in the, in, uh, in the hallway of a hospital on two gurneys that just happened to be parked next to each other? That was a, a unforgivable, unforgettable moment that, that he and I on later shows, we worked together for David Ellis on a, on a movie called Cellular and we were reminiscing. And also Tommy and I worked together on Starsky and Hutch and a bunch of other films after that. But that's where I first met the legend Tommy Huff. And what a unique um, <laughs> novel way to meet uh, somebody that uh, you've always wanted to meet. And that's uh, that's one of the stories I'll I'll never forget. I'm glad I had a chance to share that that story with you. 
there was, uh, you know, there was another story I'd like to share with you, which um, happened on on the Dukes of Hazard. Um, so many of those those days are just embedded in my brain because it's it's just with such an impressionable time. I was still young in my career, still learning, and there was um, there was a shot to do uh, again towards the the end of the day uh, that required the Roscoe car jumping off into this pond. And this was out when we moved from shooting out behind Lake Sherwood, we moved out to Valencia. And there was this disgusting pond out there, just thick black water. I mean, it was so disgusting that like the mud hens didn't even want to go into the water. And the catfish were trying to just climb out on the shore. They were disgusted. It was just awful, awful uh, black pond that was just, as I said, disgusting. I don't know how else to explain it. It was just gross. And they had set these jump ramps to jump the Roscoe car off into the pond. And they had cut out the floorboard on the passenger side and two, like a foot by foot hole. And in the back seat on both sides behind the driver and the passenger side, they did the same. They cut out these holes because what they wanted was the car to jump through the air, land in the middle of the pond, and then sink, just immediately sink to the bottom. And they had the windows all down. And then they wanted to see the stunt double for Roscoe pop to the surface and start to swim to shore. And they were going to use Jerry Summers to do the jump. And I was just going to be there to watch uh, with a couple of the other stunt guys. And I think Jerry Summers started thinking about how disgusting the water was and didn't want to, because I forget who it was. Somebody else went into that pond doing something and uh, they got, their nose was infected and their ears got infected. And, and so Jerry was like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go jump into that pond. Let's have Corey do it. So, Next thing I know, it's, hey, Corey, you're going to jump this car into the pond. And I'm like, oh, um, okay. Um, I had no idea, but yeah, you know, great. And they lead me up to the car and I, I, I get my, my stunt bag and I put my, you know, I get to put my shin guards on and they're like, no, 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 no. You can't wear any of that stuff. You're going to be full figure Roscoe. I said, oh. Okay, so all of a sudden they come up, you know, with the wardrobe and you get dressed right there on set and they put the gun belt on me and the the hat and and I'm climbing into this car and Richie Birch, you know, I've, I've mentioned him before. He was our, our camera car driver, but he was also help all the stunt guys and he brought a little pony tank, a little tank that would hold about three minutes worth of, of, of oxygen and a regulator. And he asked me, he goes, do you know how to use a regulator? And I said, no, I, I'm not a certified diver. No, I don't. And so he showed me real quick how to clear it. He goes, well, you got to push this button here to clear it if you're underwater so you don't start sucking in water and then just breathe normally. Just breathe through your mouth and you'll have three minutes of air. And he secured it to the seat next to me. And I thought, well, that's kind of not really going to be necessary because what I plan on doing is as soon as that car hits the, hits the water, I'm going to climb right out the window and, and swim to shore as soon as it starts to sink. Cause that's what, that's the shot. That's how it was explained to me. As soon as the car starts to sink and it gets up like to the light bars, climb out the window, swim towards shore. So I then did, I uh, got, I got all my, my lap belt on, didn't have a five point harness, just a lap belt. And that was already in the vehicle. It wasn't mine. It was already put in there. And I got back to my number one starting spot, which was over this little hill. So where I was at my number one, I could not see the jump ramps. So I'm going to do a rehearsal to get just to see if I can get enough speed coming up over this hill. And they give me an action cue for the rehearsal. And I come driving up the hill and, and approach the jump ramp. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be good. It's lined up good and straight. And, but it's, but when I came to a stop, all of this dust was swirling through the air and now we're starting to lose our, our sunlight. It's, you know, the sun's setting in the West and now it's that panic mode. Like we got to go, we got to go, got to go. They're like, Corey, get back to number one, get the number one. And George, bring in that water truck and water this down. Just soak all this. So it's not going to be dusty. So I go back up over the hill to my number one position. I'm, you know, sitting there waiting. There was a PA next to me holding a walkie talkie. And I could see, you know, George, just the top of his 
water truck going, you know, make it made a couple passes, you know, back and forth to wet down the area. Then I saw him disappear and I heard him say, okay, we're rolling cameras. Corey, are you ready? I go, yep. Tell him I'm ready. And the PA says, yeah, Corey's ready. And they go, action, action. And I take off. Well, when I came up over the hill and I got into that dirt, which was watered down and instantly turned into the, the, this very slippery mud and I was still accelerating the the ass end of my car started to pitch out to the left and I went to counter steer it back to the right and then oh that was too much so I went to counter steer back the other direction and I actually went off these jump ramps these two mini ramps not completely sideways but like at a 45 degree angle but the ass end of my car was still coming around toward the driver's side and I remember I'm in the air and I'm heading toward the water and I could see the water's going to come right in my window. Uh, it, I'm going to hit kind of sideways. And it did and just smacked me in the face. I, I didn't know that the water was going to be that hard when you got your window down and just smacked me in my face. And, and, and man, that car started to sink fast. And I reached down to get my lap belt and I'm feeling the gun belt that I'm, I'm wearing, like I mentioned, I had to put on, you know, I was full figure. Roscoe had his boots, his pants, his shirt, and his gun belt. And the gun belt felt a little bit like the lap belt. And I'm trying to find the latch for the lap belt so I can release it, so I can climb out. And I can't find it. And now my I could feel the water coming up to my chest, up to my neck, up to my face, and I'm, I'm just trying as hard as I can to find that latch for the lap belt. And I can't. And now I know I'm going under. And I had to take a breath, a big breath of air, and hold my breath, which was something I would, I would normally do when I'd go surfing. And a big wave, you knew, was just going to, you know, nail you and just push you down toward the ocean floor. You'd take a big breath of air and just hold your breath. So I knew I could hold my breath, you know, for almost a minute. That That's not very impressive to a lot of divers who can really go down in two, three minutes. I, I can only really comfortably hold my breath for about a minute. And so I took a big, deep breath and underwater I go. And I can't even see my hands. That black, murky water was just disgusting. And you could, the visibility, I literally could not see my hands in front of my face. And I'm trying to find that latch. Can't find it anywhere. And for the first time in my life, I will admit, I will say that I, I started to panic. I literally started the panic. I thought maybe I could just bust the lap belt loose. Um, uh, maybe I can, it's loose enough that I could, you know, kind of, you know, wiggle my way out of it. And I was panicking and I, for reason, I don't know what, what reason I'd suddenly realized, wait a minute. I didn't put in these lap belts. These are not mine. See, because I would always have my release on the driver's side door side. So I would reach across with my right hand and I could pull it. So if somebody needed to reach in and get my lap belt and release it for me, it was closer to the door. It wouldn't be, they wouldn't have to reach all the way across my lap. At least that's how I was taught. That was the, the right way to put in your lap belt. So the release was closer to the door. And I remembered I didn't put in my lap belt somebody else put the lap belt in and they put it in backwards where the release was on the other side. So I just reached over and felt it went, there it is. And I pulled the latch and I went to go out the door, out the window and I felt mud. And immediately I envisioned in my mind that the bottom of this pond was shaped like a V, like a ditch. And that this vehicle the Roscoe patrol car had just sunk to the bottom on its wheels. And I have mud now on both sides of me and I'm trapped. That's what my mind was telling me. That's what was happening. And I remember feeling that mud and I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to have to dig myself out of here. I can't hold my breath any longer. And I was trying to dig that mud and it was, it was hard. It was deep. And I thought this is going to be impossible. And I'll go, wait a minute, the pony tank, that Richie Birch put in. Where's that? And I found the tank, but I couldn't find the regulator. So I went to the end of the tank and found where the line went into the tank. And I cupped it with my hand and my index finger, and my thumb. And I 
slid it all the way to the end because the, the line, the, the regulator line was about a foot and a half long. And I found that regulator. And I remember what Richie Birch told me, push the button to clear it. So I pushed the button and I stuck it in my mouth. And I realized, okay, Corey, you've got three minutes to figure this out. And I thought, are they going to be someone coming in to try to rescue me? Or how are they going to get inside? I'm, I'm trapped. And I, as I was there trying to figure out what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this situation? I'm not going to drown. I got three minutes to figure this out. I realized that the bubbles were not going straight up in front of my face. They were going off to the side. And I thought, that's impossible. If you blow out air, if you're in the swimming pool and you blow air you know, out of your lungs, out of your mouth, the bubbles go straight up. And that's when I had that aha moment. Wait a minute. That's up. This vehicle's not on its wheels. It's on its side. Follow the bubbles. And so I swam out the, I followed the bubbles, which were going out the passenger window. And I swam out the passenger window and I popped up to the surface. And I was like, just, you know, so relieved to have gotten out of there alive and to get yelled at by Paul Baxley. <laughs> who was directing the second unit to yell, what took you so long? We had to cut cameras. And I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. I was, I was busy drowning and I couldn't get to, couldn't get to the surface in time. So that that was again, one of the, one of the moments in my career, I'll never forget it. You know, the first time ever uh, panicking, but realizing in situations like that, it's best to, to keep your cool, to slow down, to think it through, and to try to explore all the possibilities. You can't do that when you're panicking. So if there's uh, a piece of advice I could give to someone who's starting out in the stunt business, it's uh, if you're one of those individuals that have a tendency to panic, maybe you ought to think about a different occupation because you can't panic if you want to survive in the stunt in the stunt business. I remember that afternoon, um, uh, the, in the medic, Mike Escobozo, he, he went and got some, some alcohol to spray into my nose and my ears. And he's, he's like, yeah, you're probably going to get infected if we, you know, that pond is, is disgusting water. I'm like, oh, that's just awesome. I had to leave from there, from set to go to, um, a rodeo, uh, down in Brawley and, um, I remember just, you know, the, the long drive down with the stinky, the stinky hair and, and, uh, I had my rigging bag in my, in my truck and I was going down to get on this, this bucking horse, uh, the fly new rodeo, uh, contractor cotton roster had this, this horse number 23 Roni. And this bucking horse was notorious for rearing up in the bucking chute. And the best thing to do is when you would run your hand into your into your bareback rigging and, and get ready was that you would ask them to give you a quiet gate. And what that means is the guy in the arena that's going to open up the gate, they 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 open it quietly because if if the horse, if this twenty three Roni hears the gate, he immediately goes to to rear in the chute and sometimes would flip over backwards. So I asked this guy, I said, Hey, when I nod my head, could you give me a quiet gate? And he's like, yeah, 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 sure. I don't think he knew what I meant by that because he did not give me a quiet gate. He rattled it when I nodded my head and this horse flipped over in in the chute. And when he came down on me, uh, it broke my left collarbone, snapped it right in half. And then he opened the gate and the horse flopped out and I flopped out on the ground and Anyway, that was on a Friday night um, and after leaving the Duke set. And I went to the hospital there down in Brawley and they x-rayed it. And then they try to line it up the best they can. And then they put this harness on you, like a figure eight harness that pulls your shoulders back. And if you've ever broken your collarbone, which a lot of us have, it's a common injury, especially for guys who ride um, motorcycles. Um, It's it's not comfortable. It's painful. It hurts. It aches. It's, it's not, it's not a pleasant feeling, but I had Friday night, Saturday, 
Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, for it to start to heal before I showed up for work uh, again on the Dukes of Hazard out there in Valencia on Monday morning. And I didn't want anybody to know that I had broken my collarbone because I thought, well, maybe they might send me home because I'm injured. I got a broken bone. I can't work. And I wanted to work. I needed to work. I, I, I needed... I needed that paycheck every week to to support my my rodeo addiction cuz I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't a very good bull rider, I wasn't a very good bareback rider, but doggone it, I was addicted and I was consistent. I went to a, between 60 to 70 rodeos a year. Um I did place at some rodeos. I did win a couple rodeos, but like I said, I I was not um very gifted. But but it was just um, a fun time in my life that that I enjoyed doing every weekend and 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 I was addicted to it like some kind of a drug, and working on the Dukes of Hazard uh, provided me the financing, uh, the finances that I could pay for my entry fees and and gas and hotel rooms and keep going down the road and uh, living that that rodeo lifestyle that I was enjoying so much. So I didn't want to say anything to anybody on the on the set that I had a broken collarbone for fear they would send me home. And I walked by and we're on set and Al Wyatt Jr. comes up. Hey, how you doing, Corey? And he's looking at me funny and he's looking at my shirt and he could tell that he goes, wait a minute, you, you got a figure eight harness. Did you did you break your collarbone? I'm like, yeah, but Alan, don't don't tell anybody, please. He turns around and he sees Gary Baxter goes, hey, Gary, come over here. Corey broke his collarbone. And Gary comes up with this grin on his face, like, really, you broke your collarbone? Which one is it? And I go, and just as I start to point to which one it was, he throws a straight right and punches me in my shoulder. Now, when he punched me in my shoulder, I could immediately feel that the bones that had had those three days to kind of tack together to try to start the healing process. I felt the two bones snap apart. And it was very painful. And I I made a loud noise like, ah, like that. And he goes, oh, what's wrong? Did that hurt? And I said, yeah, Gary, it hurt. And I, I was mad. I go, yeah, Gary, it did hurt. And I spun around and I go, it felt like this. And I threw a straight right and hit him in his shoulder. And just instinctfully, it's like, you know, someone punches you, you try to punch him back twice as hard. And when I punched him in his shoulder, he he put up his fist like he was going to come at me. And I remember Al Wyatt Jr. stepping in between like to stop him. And Henry Kinji was there and Bob Orson and Jerry Summers and a lot of the crew were watching. Because we're right there in the middle of the crew on set when this happened. And Gary was mad. Don't you ever hit me. Like yelling, you know, and and Alan was like, it's, it's okay. And so I turn like I'm going to walk away. And all of a sudden, Alan passes me, and he's like, are you all right? And I go, yeah. And he looks past me, like over my shoulder with this look like, uh-oh. And I'm like, what? And I turn around, and Gary was already throwing another right. I mean, he threw it from left field and just belted me right in the mouth, just bam. And it hit my nose and my mouth, and my teeth went through my upper lip, and and my nose started bleeding, and, th- and then everyone just jumped, and that's, whoa, that's enough, man, let's stop, stop, you guys, stop, and I was like, felt, you know, defenseless, I have a broken collarbone, and and when I boxed, I mean, my left hook was everything to me, my left jab, my left hook, I mean, I had a very good, you know, straight right, and an overhand right, but my my left was everything to me, my lead, and I'm thinking, I, I can't really even fairly defend myself here, more or less, you know, get even with him, and and I'm like, and also, you know, it's, you know, his, his, you know, uncle Paul is, is the second unit director and stunt coordinator who I'm working for. And how's that going to look if I punch him and in, in the face and, and to get even and why well, get, I'll definitely get fired. Well, these things are going through my mind. And all of a sudden we see Richie Birch stop the, the camera car and Paul Baxley was sitting on the back of it with the script supervisor and a couple cameras that they had just set. Cause we were going to do some running shots and everybody in the set just like froze. And Paul's looking at me and he sees this blood just dripping from my nose and my mouth. And, and he says, Hey babe, what happened? And I thought to myself, you know what? I, 
I can't be a snitch. I can't say, well, you know, Gary, you know, belted me in the face when I wasn't looking. I, so I just, I looked at Gary and I looked at kind of the crew members, like, and it was like, there was that moment. There was that deciding moment. What are you going to do? And I looked over at the General Lee and I said, well, sir, I didn't know that the brakes on that General Lee were so sensitive. And when I stomped on the brakes, my face hit the steering wheel and it, he goes, well, you ought to be more careful next time. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, yes, sir. I, I will be. And I never, I never went and told Paul what had happened. Um, at lunchtime, I saw him, you know, call Gary Baxley into his dressing room so he could question him. And then as Gary left and Al Wyatt Jr. went in and after Alan left, Jerry Summers went in and through, he got the, a little piece of the story from everybody and, and figured out exactly what had happened. And I think it was on that day that by me not snitching and saying that, you know, hey, Gary, you know, punched me in the face when I wasn't ready for it, um, I guess earned a lot of respect from the crew and from the stunt department. And I really felt the difference from that day forward as being accepted uh, as one of the stunt guys. And kind of a kind of a hard way to get uh, to get, <laughs> you know, initiated or to be accepted. But that's that's uh, that's how it happened for me. And it was it was after that that I started um, driving the General Lee uh, all the time when it was a a, a Luke double. Um, I started doing the majority of the big jumps and the big if there was turnovers to do. It was um, I don't know if because they felt they felt bad about what had happened to me or I just you know won them over and it was uh, life changing for me actually um, from that day forward and. I am one who believes uh, in forgiveness and the power of forgiveness, and um, thank God for that because that that was that was emotional emotional time for me, and, and you know as a as a I think it was you know nineteen or twenty years old, but uh, and if there's a, ever a message I can give to any any of you that are listening to this, you know, forgiveness is is a beautiful thing that lets you go on with your life and not have animosity and anger. And, um, it's healthy. Hey, listen, I hope you enjoyed these, these stunt stories I've shared with you. And if you have, I hope that you will, uh, consider subscribing and helping spread the word to tell your friends, uh, about these stunt stories. Thanks and have a great day.